harpsichord. And to do so, I have my husband and harpsichordist of Ensemble Hesperi, Thomas Avery. Hi, Tom. Hello. So tell me, how did you get into playing the harpsichord? It's a bit of a niche thing to do. <laughs> it is, it's a good question. Um, well, I first of all trained as an organist, as you know. Um, and it wasn't really until I was doing my Masters at the Royal College of Music that I really started to get into playing the harpsichord seriously. I had actually come across the harpsichord at school and did a little bit of playing on it, but I didn't think about it really until after university, where there I focused more on choral music and church music, and that's still something which I do a lot of today. Exactly, and Tom's a really good choral conductor as well, but um, I remember at the Royal College of Music when we were studying there in, as our mas in Masters together, um, you came to some classes, didn't you, because you wanted to find out more about early music. That's right, so I basically went along to some of the classes, and as I was saying, because I actually had some of the skills already as an organist in um, inventing harmony, reading from the figured bass a little bit, I soon got roped into lots of different projects and accompanying people's recitals and exams, and that's where I really started doing it. But then I did some further study in it, um, doing an artist diploma at the Guildhall School. Um, and that's really where I sort of focused on my harpsichord playing. Yeah, exactly. And I think we were, in, a, in some sense, you were slightly forced into doing lots of harpsichord at the RCM because people like me, lots of recorder players, would ask you to accompany them all the time for their exams or, or whatever. So that's, that was great, actually. I mean, <laughs> it was good fun looking back. OK, brilliant. Um, so tell us a little bit about this harpsichord. This is your harpsichord, isn't it? That's right. Well, this is a harpsichord um, made in 2016 by Alan Gotto, a maker based in Norwich. Um, and it's basically a copy of an instrument which originally comes uh, from 1667. It's a French instrument originally. Um, the, the one that it's copied from is actually two manuals. Um, this has been made into a single manual, so it's a little bit easier to move around and carry. It's a bit shorter and a bit you lighter. You put it in the car. <laughs> and um, apart from that, it's the same as the original one in terms of its dimensions. It's got the same number of stops. It's got three different stops on it two eight-foot stops and a four-foot stop. Um, and it's, it's a wonderful instrument for lots of different things. It's a good solo instrument, um, though it's not as big as some solo instruments, of course, particularly uh, sort of later French instruments and big German instruments. But it also is a wonderful instrument for playing continuable on. It's really good. It's so nice to play with, isn't it? I mean, as a solo instrument, you, you don't want to feel that the harpsichord is too loud and is sort of overpowering you, um, right. or that it's kind of producing similar sounds so that everything blends together too much. You want to feel a bit distinct. Yeah. Um, and this is really wonderful to play with, and in the ensemble as well. Yeah. It's got a warmth to it as well, and it's got, yeah. a, got, it's got a good, rich bass part nice, as well. Deep, deep. And it's got a decent yeah, compass exactly. as well, so you can play lots of repertoire. So it's, it's a great kind of multi purpose instrument in, in the most positive way. Yeah, and it's you know it's a really good investment. It's it's very very lucky that we've been able to to to, to buy this and you know over time. Um, so, how does it actually work? I mean, this was a bit of a mystery to me to begin with. Even though I grew up with, you know in a musical household, how do we how do we actually well, make the harps? Well, how's the play? sound made? Um, basically, when we play a note, um, it hits one of these uh, called a jack up, and on the jack there is a small quill here, a little plectrum, um, that's made out of plastic nowadays, but originally would have been made out of quill, so um, from a bird's feather. And basically when this goes up, it plucks the string, just one string per jack, and then when it comes back down, um, the bit of felt, the red here you can see, I'll to show it up to the camera a little bit more, um, that dampens the string. And we've got three sets of strings on this particular instrument. Some instruments have one, two, um, well, there are some curious instruments which are bigger, but most have uh, generally two eight-foot registers and one four-foot. And so um, e each stop, each register, has a set of these jacks associated with it. So what do they, what do they sound like, the three well, different registers? So yeah. the three different registers... Um, we have our main eight foot sound. And that's the sound that I probably use the most. The other eight foot sound um, is actually located slightly differently. So the, um, the plucking happens a little bit in a different place and it has a sort of slightly nuttier quality, a thinner sound. <laughs> for that 
that are exactly the same uh, as, the, as the other one. There's no difference in the string type or material. It's just that they're um, plucked in a, in a different place. And then there's also a four-foot stop as well, which plays an octave high. And the strings for that are actually don't go all the way down the instrument, but they start only halfway down. So and what about the smaller. special effect stop? This is my favourite, and I beg him to use it all the time. But he doesn't. He he thinks it's you know only only suitable for particular movements. Um, this is something called the buff stop, and um, there's a row of small pieces of felt that are just about this big and by moving this little um, knob here you move some bits of felt next to the strings of one of the eight foot stops so without without is this and where is this so it dampens the sound it's so nice it's like a bit of a harp it's gorgeous so those are the different effects that you can make on the harp Fantastic, thank you very much, Tom. Don't forget you can check out the early music stops selection of harpsichords on their website. Here is a short ground in C minor by Henry Purcell. So Tom, you're a solo harpsichordist, but you're also a, a, a continual player. What does that mean and um, how did you learn how to do it? Well, good question. It's a big topic, actually, this one. Very big. Um, Maybe another episode sometime. Yes. When we're accompanying um, in largely Baroque music, we're often accompanying from a figured bass part. That's where we have the composer writing a bass line and... Um, usually with a sequence of numbers underneath it. 
and those numbers represent the harmony that they want to be played. It's a shorthand way of writing and it means that the harpsichordists, organists, um, also plucked continuo players, the orbos and lutes, etc., effectively are improvising the accompaniment with the harmony that we've been provided with, but it's not actually written out as the harmony. It's amazing. I mean, I'm constantly in awe of you doing it, and often you, you know, what we must remember is that whenever Tom is accompanying me, it will never be exactly the same thing twice because he's using those figures as inspiration, but you know, the moment might take him somewhere entirely different. That's right, and that, there's sort of two elements to it, really. One, of course, is just learning lots about harmony so that you can play all different harmonies fluently. Um, so when you come across them, you can easily play them. But you have to be able to play them in lots of different ways um, and in different arrangements of the notes yeah. so that you can create the different effects. And that's the sort of other skill, really. It's making an accompaniment that works for the situation that you're in. And the composers really, they thought of this art as improvisation, but even more than that, really, it's part of the composition. Yeah. And your, your right hand, um, and occasionally with some left hand notes as well in the harmony, is actually adding to that piece of music um, in quite a substantial way, and it's really giving the piece a kind of a personality as well. Um, when accompanying a solo instrument, um, you have to be very careful of what the top part of your realisation is doing because you yeah. don't want it to it can't be, be clashing. It can't be the same because otherwise it, well, it's, it's against the rules and for a good reason which is that it can sound pretty horrible if you end up playing the same note very slightly out of tune for example. So you have to always keep an eye on what the solo part's doing when that's printed. Sometimes that, that isn't the case actually. Sometimes we don't have the solo part. We so might just have our bass line. Even harder. So it's kind of part of listening as well. Yeah, I mean this is just a very difficult thing playing from figured bass and you know a lot of soloists and um, recorder players you know we don't think about it very much we don't we don't talk about it enough and we definitely don't admire our harpsichordists enough so thank you so much um, and I'm sure that we'll have another episode talking even more depth about figured bass in the future. Great. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, next week, we're going to be talking a little bit about Scottish Baroque music, something that is very close to my heart.